Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's give it up to the co-founder and CEO of Layer, an awesome guy all the way from the Netherlands, Mr. Raimo van der Klein. Raimo. Thank Good you. luck, man. Thank Thanks. you. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Woo. So, last month I've been asked, uh, or a lot of startups have been approaching me and had all kinds of questions about how do you do this, how do you do that, etc. So, what I've done today is I've listed the five questions I've been asked most, and I thought that those are probably also the questions you may find most interesting as well. So we will get to the questions later. But Ler, first, uh, let me introduce myself. So who is Raimo? Uh, usually, I don't really like to talk about myself. But being here in Finland, you're probably are asking yourself, why the hell does he have a Finnish name? Right? So I'm going to tell you that right now. So here is a picture of Finland, two places, and then an, uh, an old picture. The story here is that uh, I'm married, I have three children, uh, two girls, and one son. And the son is uh, born one and a half years ago, he's the latest, the last kid. And the moment I got a son was also the moment I really understood that, you know, my kind of lifeline, my bloodline is now going into the future. But the moment you look into the future, you also look back. And my mother pa passed away a couple of years, and I never really knew her background. Uh, so I was interested in the roots of my Finnish origin, because my mother is Finnish. And I found this picture in, uh, I went through her stuff, I found this old picture and asked relatives here in Finland about, is this my grandfather? And it is, actually. So a couple of months, I, for the first time, I really saw my grandfather. And he comes from Varkaus. And my, and my mother grew up in Kotka. So, me also can't speak how well Suomi is, it's not so good. So I'm talking with Moon and Soon and Mia and Sia. It's not really correct Finnish, I know, but it's just how uh, it's been taught to me. So I've been working uh, in mobile for already 12 years. Did a lot at Nokia, Nokia networks, Nokia mobile phones, uh, operators and other stuff. And now I'm doing Layer. So what is Layer? The best thing to do to understand what Layer is, is to download it on your mobile phone and try it out later. There you get a good picture, because I can't really explain it. But here are some stats. It's, uh, we're in the field of augmented reality. I'm going to explain later what it is. It's founded in 2009, together with Claire Bonstra and Martin Lynch and Gerald. We're based in Amsterdam, around 50 people. Um, we raised 12.5 million euros pre-revenue. <laughs> which is not easy. I'm going to tell you later probably how we did it. Uh, we're funded by Intel Capital, Sunstone Venture Capital, and Prime Ventures. Um, we have a team in Ukraine that are developing mobile clients for us. So that's uh, a little bit the context of our company. You see here our office, our new office. We just moved in here last week. It's in the center of Amsterdam. So if you're ever in the center of Amsterdam and want to visit a cool startup, feel free to do it. So why did we start Layer? We started Layer to democratize space. And what I mean with it, space currently is owned. If you look at the physical space around you, every piece you see in front of you, be it product packaging, shop windows, posters, magazines, everything is owned. There's only one sender that actually sends you messages. We want to open up the physical space around us, make it programmable, moldable and flexible, and that others can add content to the physical world as well. So that, that there is not only one reality, because that's kind of the, the flaw of current reality in a sense. So here is an example of how that would work. In the bottom here, you see a book. And on that book, well, the book has a cover, and it has some interesting information about the cover, some artwork, etc. But that's kind of all the information that's currently available of the book. And what we are doing, we are adding digital layers of content on top of the book. And those can be, I'm going to need to go a little bit closer here to read them all out. It could be uh, the, the publisher's um, review. It could be a link to Amazon, uh, reviews on Amazon, a, a buy button. 
It could be uh, a link to a local bookstore. It could be uh, user-generated reviews by people that just left it on top of the book. It could be uh, an, a trailer uh, or a message from the writer. Uh, people left uh, or maybe put on the cover of the book what they really liked about the book or some, their favorite quotes, etc. And what we believe, in a sense, is that on every piece of physical world there is, there will be a big stack of rich content. And it will help you to understand the thing you're actually looking at. So it's, if you look at such a book, you will have a much more of a holistic view of the, what the book is than just hear the publisher talking to you. So that's the ambition. And to do that, we have three main products. And I'm going to walk quickly through them so you know what kind of a startup we are. We have a browser, which is a mobile app you can download. We have a layer player. I'm going to explain what it is. And we have a platform in which augmented reality content can be created and published. So let's start with the browser. With layer, we started off working with GPS, accelerometers, gyroscopes, etc., to estimate the position of a phone. So we could estimate where people are looking at. So we could kind of put digital information in their camera view to show them what they're looking at. That's kind of the old technology we started with in 2009. And that's the browser 5.0, which is currently out there. We're very soon going to launch layer 6.0. And that's the moment that the, that the phone can actually look at things and recognize things. It can look at the book, recognize the book, and get the associated content from the web on the, on the book itself. We're going to launch it pretty uh, soon. So I'm going to start a video now. I'm going to start a video now. I'm sharp. Are you ready? And it's going to show, shortly show you what it is, because it works much better if you see it than that I'm talking about it. Yeah, that was the right one. Cool. <laughs> so that was the video. I think I gave you probably a good idea about what we do and how it a little bit works. So it's about discovering more. The moment you see a poster, for example, in a, at the bus stop, you hold your phone in front of it, scan it, and you can see that you can, if it's a nice event, you can immediately add it to, the, to your calendar, buy the ticket, see more information, reserve it, share it with friends, etc. So that was a browser. We got more than 
3,000 different content layers there, and the app has been downloaded, by the way, more than 12 million times uh, now. We also have a big uh, a piece of technology which is called Layer Player. It's a, if you have your own iPhone app, for example, or Android app, here is an example of an Amsterdam City app, and you think what would, it would be very cool to add augmented reality to my existing app. You can with the Layer Player. It's like a piece of embed code, like you kind of embed a YouTube video inside of an app or in a website. You can now also embed AR content inside your own app. Here's an example of a street art uh, app. It shows you street art in the city around you, and you can walk towards it. Next to that, we have the Layer Platform. So the biggest challenge, of course, what we have faced is to get content, get people motivated to build all this content on top of all these things and places that are out there. And we've put a lot of time in the platform, in, its, in a sense. And there are different ways to kind of make content currently. One, you can be a developer, make your own content. Or there are a lot of creation tools. Because of our APIs, it's possible to remotely, on a separate CMS, for example, very simple, without programming skill, build your own AR experiences. And we've got more than 10 layer creation tools. Here are a couple of them. And if, if you go to their websites, they tell you that it's very easy to make a layer right here on their site, which is published in our browser. And then we have more than 10,000 developers worldwide that are making content uh, for the browser and, and also for, for players. And they can also be found on our website. So that's in short layer. So now let's get to the five questions I've been asked most by startups lately. Here they are. How did you get started? How did you get so much funding? How did you get so much traction? How do you build a great team? And how do you earn money? Kind of very logical startup-y questions. Interesting thing here, they're all how questions. So a lot of startups are probably interested in the mechanics and behaviors of a system, how you can make it work. So let's get to the first one. How did you get it started? Well, so I, it started basically in 2007 when I met my co-founder for the first time. It was as a, at a science fiction uh, event in Amsterdam. It's called Science Fiction, Science Fiction. And it was about how science fiction influences real life and how real life influences science fiction. And there were two speakers there. One was, are you serious? He's a kind of cyberpunk guy from the end 90s. And there's a science fiction writer, Rudy Rucker. And they had two words, which were, for me, in 2007, completely new. One was adhocracy, and the other one was hylozoism, um, which I found fascinating. I will explain you uh, what these are. Adhocracy is an organization that just comes together for a certain purpose. It's a kind of the, the opposite of a bu bureaucracy. And hylozoism is matter coming to life. And I never knew that these two words, that I would work so much with them in, a, in these years following 2007. Because what we have been doing continuously is to assemble ourselves for a certain purpose. And we've attracted a lot of people, a complete ecosystem, for the purpose to democratize space. And with Layer, actually, what we're doing is we make matter come to life, it becomes interactive. So that was fascinating for me to see that it already originated in 2007. I wrote a blog post with these two words as kind of stood, that those stood out, and that somehow they would be related. So after 2007, with my co-founder Martin Lance Fitzgerald, which I met then, and later also Claire, we were fascinated by science fiction. Two pieces of content especially. One was Deno Coil on the left. It's an anime series from Japan showing you how life would look when you would wear kind of AR glasses. And another one is a book called Rainbow's End by Verna Vinci. Verna Vinci, both cases in a sense show you a world where AR is a medium. You just continuously have it on and you flip through various layers of content, various views. And that really inspired us that there needs to be such a medium where you just are in and you can view different content coming from different sources and you can discover everything around you. And then in 2008, the G1 came to the market, the first Android phone. 
And this phone had, an, had a compass and an accelerometer. And these two sensors were essential to kick off AR. Now, for the first time, we could make a very first version of an AR medium, in a sense. So we were excited about it. And then the question comes, of course, are we going to do it or not? Are we going to play something in this field which is now emerging, or are we just going to look at it and talk about it? So what we did pretty quickly after the launch of the G1, we make this kind of Gartner hype cycle. It shows you that you have a hype. This is actually still in the office. It's hanging on the wall. Because thank God for this, we're still here. It's the, the Gartner hype cycle showing us how AR will move through the hype cycle. First, it will become a big hype. Then everybody will be disappointed. And then slowly, a business will emerge out of it. And we knew back in 2008 already that we will go through it. If we step in now, we will ride the wave of hype, then have a tough moment, and then survive afterwards as a business. You also see what happens if you kind of don't have a business, you kind of fall off. And under it, you see the years. So first it was 10, 11, 12. And then we thought, no, it will be quicker. It will be 9, 10, 11. Well, actually, it is 10, 11, 12. It takes longer to go through the cycles. So we're now in the middle. That's where we are now with AR. I'm going to talk later more about that. So the moment we knew this, are we going to ride the wave or not? And if we're going to ride the wave, what are we going to do? So for us, the mission, if we wish to accept it, was are we going to plant the seed of a new mass medium, which is AR? And are we going to face all the tough battles that will be confronted to us when we need to do this. Because it, this is a tough cookie to do if you're a little startup, a couple of guys in Amsterdam, and not some kind of big corporation. But we went for it. And in March 2009, uh, we didn't have any money. So how do we get started? We said, well, if you're going to make a medium, let's talk so to, to some brands. I think it's a hot item. They're probably interested in the PR. So we knew a lot of brands in Amsterdam. We said, OK, let's make a first version of this app with a couple of layers, which we will build for them for a fee. So we would Hives is a Dutch social network. They were interested. Funda, which is a Dutch real estate agent, they were interested. So you could look around to see houses for sale. We had ING Bank, so you could see ATMs, where the nearest ATM is around you. So we had a couple of brands. They all kind of paid 10,000 euros. And that set us up for 40, 50,000 euros so we could build the first prototype. We did this in March, and in June we launched, knowing that this is, and the, the big problem is, is that we are, it's even worse for you guys, you have a small home market. The Netherlands, we are at 17 million. That's a, that's a small market. And then you have, the, you, have to, you have to ask yourself, am I going to make a product for my home market, or do I see another market as my home market? And we knew that if we're going to be in a Dutch company, we're going to be swallowed by Dutch brands, and they're going to have all kinds of demands, and we will be owned by the Netherlands. And we will, be, we will never be able to become a global company if you go for the Netherlands in the beginning. So what we did is um, when we launched, we had an, 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 an English press release associated to it. So it was a Dutch case stating that in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, now, the people of Amsterdam can now look around and see information around them as, wow, look at what's going on in Amsterdam. So we spread it around, and it was picked up by press. They all loved that story. So we were in the New York Times a couple of days later with this story because they just loved it. And we took a Dutch canal, kind of Amsterdam canal picture, and really played the Amsterdam card to our advantage to get international press. So. This happened, and that was kind of the beginning. When we did this, 19th of June, I think we launched. And a week later, we knew we need funding, we need a CTO, we need all kinds of things. If you look at our backgrounds as founders, we're marketeers. So we know how to do this. This we know, how to build a platform, and how, how to build a browser, we have no clue. So thank God we knew some great guys, which started pretty quickly. And then we went off. 
And uh, one of the key things here is that it all started not with a clear purpose, consumer segment, um, so what, why would I use it, questions, business case. We just wanted to build it. It just needed to be there. And we made sure it would be because we believed it would inspire a lot of people. Later, we understood it would be about democratizing space and that we actually are opening up space and challenging things like copyright and ownership. That was later. But the, the, I think the key uh, insight here is, if you think you need to build it, just build it. And our lesson was really to focus and commit. We had so many, so many opportunities in the beginning about companies approaching us that they say, okay, can you build it for us? Can we have a white label version? And all kinds of questions. And I think 90% of the time we say no to things. And you really need to say 90% of the time you need to say no to opportunities and pick out the right ones. And what, what's really helpful to have a kind of idea about what you really want to accomplish. And also another thing here about the commit part is when I talk to a lot of startups, they have these stories about, for example, a couple of weeks ago, a, a startup came to me and they said, yeah, 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 so we're doing something with healthy food. We have an app and you can kind of check in what you ate and uh, it's gamification and a website and an app and blah, blah, blah. And I had a whole story about it and I said, yeah, and if it, if it then takes off, we're going to spend more time on it because we now have our other job that kind of pays for it. So if then we see a little bit more traction, then we kind of slowly kind of hand it over and then go full for the startup. This I hear a lot. I don't think that works. I really would urge you to, as quickly as possible, create a situation that you can dedicate it work on your startup. Because it, it's, it's not going to fly if you're going to do it part-time or not completely 100% dedicated to it. Uh, so what I told these people which are working with Healthy Food, I said, what is really your passion? Because they had a lot of problems with recruiting and finding people and uh, setting priorities for the site, etc. What is your passion? I said, well, we want people to eat well. We're passionate about healthy food. I said, what, what, what are you passionate about? About healthy food. And they kind of repeat, I repeated it a couple of times. And I said, just, just talk about healthy food. Just talk to people that are interested in healthy food. Just hire a designer that's interested in healthy food. Does, don't just hire anybody. You know, and if, put all your time in healthy food. And put yourself also in the equation. Because what, what tends to happen is that a lot of startups kind of, the success of the startup is the success of the thing they've built. You know, they, they kind of shove their app or their website in front of them, but you know, it's just a means, it's a means, it's not the end goal. The website, the app is not the end goal. You have to put yourself as an entrepreneur in the position and commit yourself to a cause and then only share that cause. And then people will come to you, everything kind of will happen by itself. That's what we believe. So, second question. How did you get so much funding for a small company with no revenue and no real proof? So, guess where we thought we would need funding? <laughs> well, it's here. So here we knew get massive funding. That was kind of an imperative when we started. There is a moment that we will ride the, the hype wave and then we need to kind of get a big war chest of gold and then face the dark winter of Finland, in a sense. And then we, you know, and then it's closing the doors again, working hard to build a business. And then you need to have the lifetime to run that out. It's, this is crucial for us. So we knew this would happen. So hype is equal to belief. And what we needed to do is create belief. So we worked hard. We worked that hype cycle <laughs> like crazy. And so yes, it will be a medium. Yes, Layer is the largest platform. Yes, Layer is the biggest brand in AR. And yes, Layer has a strong brand. And we've pushed these messages a lot. And every time repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. And we got a lot of interest. A lot of people came to us and uh, we were very lucky to find an investor that was willing to uh, pay the pre-money valuation we uh, kind of put on the table. And here, I think it's important just, just to be bullish. So, and stand out as well from the crowd. 
we got one thing I also noticed with VCs, they get pitched a lot. So you really need to stand out. You need to behave differently. You need to behave differently so a VC notices you. For example, we didn't do a lot of startup scenes. Our startup, we didn't call ourselves a startup. We called it ourselves a new medium. And, um, and I think what helped really is that we behaved differently than others. We were not in Silicon Valley, we were in Amsterdam. And you need to play those cards to no, be noticed and stand out from the crowd. And one of the most important things is share your story, don't pitch it. VCs really don't like to be sold to. They want to break down that selling layer and see who you really are. So just do that from the beginning. Don't waste your time trying to pitch something and then have these difficult questions. So he wants to look behind the curtain who you really are. Just show who you really are, share your story, and then you have much more likely to kind of build a relationship with a VC. Next to that, even if you're not interested in funding, build relationships with VCs because they like to see progress. And if they see progress, they're much more likely to invest in you. How much time do I have? 20? 90? So, third question How do you get so much traction? Three things. Again, standing out from the crowd. Do your own marketing and be a bright light. So standing out from the crowd. What we did, we had more than 500,000 apps in the market to com compete with. So how do we do that? Don't call yourself an app. So we call ourselves a browser. It's a small difference, but hey, there are not so many browsers. So it's a much more interesting story than just another app. Another thing, it's the Amsterdam card. Be proud of it, play it a lot, and, and don't be afraid that you're not in Silicon Valley or be ashamed of that you're not from there. If, if I would be from Finland and be a startup, I would say that I, I have a little cottage in the woods and we're building great technology from that cottage. That's a, cool, that's a cool story. And you will stand out. Do your own marketing. So we tried to hire a couple of PR firms, but they never really got the messaging right. The, the heart was not in it. So as a founder, you really need to put your own heart in it. So I would really urge you to do your own marketing, at least your own messaging. Do not be convinced about PR agencies that they tell you what to tell your customers or your uh, industry partners. And we did it always, and it worked. And it, it's kind of great to have these moments in time to really spend a lot of time in what do we really want to tell to whom and really get to the core of the message. And then be a bright light. So here science fiction helps, right? So we showed them a future that could be a little keyhole inside of the future. And that attracted a lot of people. That attracted press, investors, developers, customers, you name it. Handset manufacturers, operators, We've been pre-installed on Samsung phones. Uh, US operators used us in their uh, uh, commercials, like Verizon did that. The Droid, uh, we had the Droid commercials in the US. So everybody was kind of interested in that future notion. And then everything just comes to you. We didn't need to go anywhere to be in contact with press or VCs or users or developers. It all came to us because we spent time in creating a bright light a vision of the future. And that scales, people. This really scales. It doesn't scale to go everywhere and run around crazy trying to find the right people in this world. It's too complex and too dynamic. Just try to create a bright light of attraction. Lesson learned, know when to shut up. So when the hype is over, shut up and pivot. That's what we did as well. I think in December last year, we really understood, OK, this GPS thing, it's over now. You know, it's at the end of its hype. Now we really need to kind of work, close the doors, get in, and pivot. And that's what we did now with the uh, computer vision technology that you can really recognize images and put uh, objects on top of it, or digital content on top of it. And it's very tempting uh, to believe the hype first, uh, and to believe your own success. But we told each other every time it's just the hype. It's nothing yet. It's all belief. And don't get too used to it. Fourth one, how do you build a great team? Um, I think here is probably the, 
the foundation of our success. It's how we as a group behave. And what we spend a lot of time in is two things. One is to break through our personal ceilings, and the other one is in positioning of people. And let me just clarify that a little bit. So breaking through pers personal ceilings, it's about the moment you are faced with challenges, you show certain behavior which is based on your heritage and your education and uh, 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 how you've been grown up. So, uh, and every time you've kind of, that normally is effective, but if you face bigger challenges, it might be that your behavior is not effective anymore. And what we have in, in Layer is a culture that if we see that your behavior is not effective anymore, there's probably a personal reason behind it, a fear, an insecurity, a belief that needs to be broken down so that you can move along and become effective again. For example, for me, when I'm faced with tough, tough situations, I take control. I take care of business, I move people aside, and I'm going to do it myself. That works in the early stages of a startup. In a later stage of a startup, that doesn't work. So with 50 people, and we're facing a tough product discussion or situation, and I would take over, that wouldn't work. So there I need to learn that that behavior, which was kind of, you know, when I'm confronted with kind of uh, a, a certain uh, exciting situation, I get in that mode, I need to kind of notice that and bring it down. And what we do is every month we have uh, sessions with a personal coach in which we discuss, discuss if you're still uh, uh, having effective behavior and if there's anything within the team that's preventing us of being very effective. And we spend hours on top for this. Uh, and it really helps. The other one is positioning of people. So this is kind of a strange way, but what we like to do at Layer, we like to kind of open up a space and that everybody just starts to stand in that space and say, okay, th if this is Layer, that's the market, and these are our competitors, let's move them around and let's see where everybody stands. So what you then have is that the CEO stands here, the product guy stands there, the CTO, etc. So we kind of are positioned and it, what, I don't know how it works, but what you see is how you relate to everybody, and that sometimes you can't see things. And pop, some people say, okay, I'm standing here, but I'm not comfortable. I want to be closer to product. Or I can't see the market because the biz dev guy is in front of me. Yeah, the biz dev guy talks to the market, and I, the product guy, am standing behind him, and I can't see what he's doing. I don't feel comfortable about that. So by having this kind of mechanism of positioning, we really understand how we as a team function and what's in the way of effectiveness again. We spend a lot of time on this. I don't know, it, it works for us. I don't know if it, it may sound a little bit abstract, but um, I think it's a crucial part of our success that we continuously break down our personal ceilings so we, so we can grow. One of the key things, of course, is to have a safe environment to do this. And to create a safe em environment, one of the things you need to let go is ego. If you have a lot of ego, this will be tough to do. If you are competitive, very competitive, and you have a big ego, it will be very hard to, to, to kind of acknowledge your weaknesses. And I think that's key, acknowledging your weaknesses. And I think here probably the Finnish culture helps you as well to create this, to create a strong team. Lesson learned, dig deep, even deeper. If you think a problem is complex, you're not digging deep, deep enough. Until now, every time we faced a big problem and it looks complex, we just needed to dig a little bit deeper, ask ourselves, why is this? Where does it come from? And then in the end, it's most of the time a very simple solution, which is right in front of you. So don't believe in big, complex problems. Just dig deeper. Oh, and then another one, I just wanted to share it here. I didn't know where, I didn't know where to put it. But don't introduce many nouns. So what do I mean with that? Let's say you are at a management team meeting with your startup, and then suddenly somebody brings in a new noun, like newsletter. Let's do a newsletter. Sounds great, right? Yeah, let's do a newsletter. But what it opens up is a world of more nouns, more partners, more metrics, KPIs, questions, responsibilities, etc., and it just overcomplicates your whole organization. And it all happens when you just introduce nouns. So, for example, for a newsletter, 
you have a noun like MailChimp. We need a professional organization. So who is, who is responsible for the newsletter? And who's responsible for the content of the newsletter? Who's responsible for MailChimp? Who's doing the maintenance of it? Who's acquiring it? Who's doing the benchmarking? Who's doing the conversion rates? Who's responsible for the conversion rates of the newsletter? And then you get this whole world around the newsletter, and then it becomes an entity in itself, and we all forget why we started to do newsletters in the first place. And this is kind of what's happening now. That's why I put it here, is be very sure when you introduce a noun in your organization, that you accept also the consequences. Because there's a big world behind every noun you put in your organization. And the last one, how do you earn money? Good question. So let's start with a definition which I really like of a startup. A startup is a temporary organization designed to discover a profitable, scalable business model. It's by Steve Blank. It's a temporary organization designed for a purpose. Sounds a lot like an ad hocracy for me. So this is our team. It's a project organization. In the beginning, you're a project organization just finding a business model. And we've had, we have had many. This is us, 2009 to now, all kind of different business model ideas and our iterations we had. We started off thinking that, you know what? We will make all the layers in the world ourselves. So if somebody in New York comes and wants to build a layer, I said, sure, that's 20,000 euros, we're going to build you a great layer. Well, a week after we launched, we knew, well, that doesn't gonna, that's not going to scale. We got people from South Korea, Chile, Australia, New York, I don't know where, all coming to us, asking us to build layers. So we needed to let that med or business model go, because that business model doesn't fit with the medium. If you want to become a medium, you can't also produce all the content here, especially in our case, because it's just such a long time. We have no idea what needs to be augmented in, in Chile. So we let go of that model. Then we thought, you know what, how are we going to do it? Every time somebody publishes a layer in our browser, we're going to ask a publishing fee, and we're going to create very cool statistics for them. And we're going to ask money for that. But then, when we kind of had those fees, and we thought a couple of hundred euros per layer, we also saw that if you are an emerging medium, that the people that are first to kind of come up with the cool ideas are not the people with the big wallets. It's artists, universities, schools, science fiction lovers that will come up with the cool idea. And if we would charge publishing fees, all that content will never hit the platform. So, doesn't fly again. So we needed to let go of that model as well. Third model was premium content. So if you have all these layers, probably some layers are worth paying for. A Lonely Planet layer of Barcelona. Maybe you can pay $3.99 for that. Could be cool. So we built that payment system under it and see if it would fly. Nobody's selling layers on our platform. So it didn't fly. And now we are at the last one. Now we have introduced layer vision, and now we have a business model associated to layer vision. And what we do is we, ask, we, we get paid for usage. So if there is an outdoor campaign in Helsinki for a new movie or a new product, and people kind of scan it with their phone and looking at it, every time somebody looks at it, we get one cent. Is that a good model? I don't know. We will find out. So that's what we're doing now. And next to that, we see something emerging now where probably our real business model lies. Because most ideas which are coming up now are about interacting with the thing and which are associated with lead generation or purchasing, commerce. So transactions on top of physical things. Reading a magazine, seeing all these great products, and now have also the ability to buy it directly. You don't have it now. We went through a magazine in the Netherlands, one of these glossies, I think 180 of the 210 pages were filled with products that are there to kind of create desire. And there's no way to kind of really uh, purchase the product at that moment. I think there's a big opportunity for us right there. One thing I also wanted to give with you is this one, the business model canvas. Business model canvas. Who knows about this? OK, never mind. So this really helps. This so helps to build uh, a good business model. 
because there's a big confusion a lot of the time what, what the hell is a business model. And this really helped us a lot. For us, the big learning here is to combine traction with business is hard. So, and this is indeed, if you saw the hype cycle, that we're in the bottom now, and we're kind of converging or, or converting or transforming the traction in, into a business. That's the phase we are currently in with Layer. And that's not easy. But the business model canvas is a great help to do that. Oh, so I'm uh, at the end of my presentation. So I have one more video I want to show you. That's a new product we're launching in a couple of weeks. And it's the next phase of AR. AR 2.0. It's, it's, it's about user-generated content. So for, until now, you needed to be a professional to, uh, to uh, produce content on our platform. We now have a new product in the market that enables users to augment their own reality. Stick2 is a whole new way to be creative and express yourself. To get started, find an image to scan, like a magazine cover or some product packaging. With the Stick2 editor, you can add stickers, photos, text, and drawings right on top of the real world image, allowing you to quickly add your own creativity to the world around you. Then, just tap Publish to share and view your creation. Now, anyone anywhere who scans this image will see your post right on top of it. Cool. That was it. Thank you very much.